Good morning. Um, I've no idea uh, what you're expecting from this session. I think the official description um, was just home truths, which I think is the shortest session description. So does, does anyone know, did anyone uh, know what they were coming to, or are you just turning up for the points? Turning up for the interest. Well, thank you very much for coming anyway to the Mysterious Decides to Home Truths. So we're, we're talking about, um, is there a dysfunctional relationship between GPs and social care? Um, so what, what is Home Truths? Home Truths is a programme um, that's working with in uh, 11 areas around the country, um, primarily with councils, but also with the CCGs, all mentioned. Um, working alongside um, the Institute of Local Government Studies and the Health uh, Services Management Centre in the University of Birmingham. And the aim is to demonstrate that understanding and improving relationships with GPs can uh, change health and care uh, demand, and in particular could lead to keeping people out of residential care. And that's what we're aiming to do. Um, and so far, it's been really successful, actually. Um, We've got um, uh, a group of six councils started in December and uh, they're now implementing some of the findings and there's some more going now. What this has really come from is a sort of high level uh, aim of ours, um, that objective that um, really to have sustainable public services and particular social care we need to change the relationship with citizens. We need to change what, we, what we're doing, how we're relating to service users and patients, um, which is a big thing. And what does that really mean? So we're focusing in specifically on this relationship with GPs. We found that uh, there is one particular... Uh, there are lots of different relationships that impact demand, um, and one set of relationships with particular interest and particular um, reason for focus uh, around GPs, how they relate to their patients and how they relate to social care in particular. Um, and I guess what's part of that is this kind of need for a new kind of evidence, a new kind of understanding, particularly around what drives behaviour. So, um, I've got an apology. There are six pictures of Bruce Forsyth in this presentation. So I, I should have said that at the beginning, so if you'd like to leave, that's fine. If you think you can cope with that, that's right. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to ask for a volunteer now. This is a bit interactive. Um, hope, have we got any GPs in the room? No? Does anyone... Who, who thinks they might understand GPs? Can I have a volunteer to come up and help? Who, who knows how to play Play Your Cards Right? Do you remember this game? Anyone remember this? You have to guess higher or lower, and everyone's going to... Uh, I'm going to have to pick on someone, so... Or Bruno, are you going to help me? Uh, Joe? Where's Joe? Round of applause for Joe coming to help. If, if this is going to demystify the whole thing, I'd be more than happy to help. Okay, now you all have to help Joe though. Right. So I'm going to ask a set of questions. I think I've got seven questions, something like that. Um, and I'm going to ask Joe um, higher or lower. And you have to help by shouting out higher or lower if you think the answer was higher or lower. This is from our survey with GPs. So we asked, as part of this project, we've asked a whole load of GPs a number of questions about their understanding of social care, their relationship to their patients, their motivations, a whole number of things. And I just want to go through some of these now. So, all right, you up for this, Joe? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So the first question is, what percentage of GPs do you think, Joe, said their relationship with social care is poor? Do you think that was higher or lower than 50%? Higher, let's hear some offers. Higher or lower? I, I think it's lower. Lower? Lower. 56%. Really? So 56% rated their relationship with social care as poor. Okay, so we take that 56%. You can still win. It's okay. The next question was, um, do you think, so we asked GPs, do you think hospital dis discharge teams make decisions in the best interest of their patients? Do you think that's higher or lower? Lower. Lower, higher or lower? Lower. Qu quite right. Only 41% of GPs think hospital discharge teams are doing the right thing by their patients. Next question. So we take that 41%. So the next question is, do you think, what percentage of GPs do you think said, I can make a better assessment 
of the need for residential care, and therefore not home care, um, than social care can. What do you think? What do you think? Higher. Sorry, that's the trick question. It was the same. So you couldn't win, just in case you were getting cocky. For, but 41%, so 41% of GPs believe that they can make a better decision about um, social care needs than social workers. Um, we presented this to a bunch of uh, directors of adult social services recently at the spring, the spring seminar, and they were quite interested in these findings and quite surprised by some of them. So I guess the first, the first insight we've drawn from that is that, that there is a lack of trust um, between GPs and social care in particular, and it does matter. It's impacting decisions. Okay, right. So we'll take that 41%. Right, next question. Um, do you think GPs trust social care to make uh, decisions in the best interest no. of their patients? Lower, higher or lower? Lower. Higher. Higher. 73%. So higher. So um, they do trust social care broadly to make decisions, just not necessarily as much as they trust themselves, but they do trust... Uh, uh, just to be clear as well, this is not... Oh, here we go. Um, we've, been, we've been quite clear when we're talking to social care, this is not GP's problem, this is not GP bashing, this is social care's problem, this is commissioner's problem. If they're not getting their messages across, the people who are driving their demand, that's their problem. Okay, and higher or lower than 73% do you think would value closer links with GPs? Any offers? Higher. I think lower. Lower? Yeah. 92%, <laughs> including over half, strong, would strongly value that. So there is a real need there. So there's an opportunity there. There's a, there is a desire to improve relationships, and we've particularly found that there's a real lack of positive feedback in the system. GPs only hear about things when it goes wrong, when there's another patient sat in front of them. We miss all kinds of opportunities to get positive messages about, to them about who we're supporting in the community well. So next one, 56%. So we asked about some other uh, services what, that they knew about, so if they, knew, uh, what, if they trusted home care and if they trusted things, and we picked out a couple of the results. So one question we said was, do you trust um, the quality of reablement in your area? And what percentage do you think thought that was unsatisfactory was reablement? I think we're going lower in this one. Any offer, views, lower? 46%. So it was lower, but almost half think that reablement is unsatisfactory. This was um, quite, a, quite a concern to social care directors um, who often had looked at their services and evaluated their services, and they didn't feel this chimes with the quality of the services, but this is the perception. Next question. We, we asked them, um, do, you, do you think it's... Uh, what do you think of the quality of the service? But one of the options was, I don't think this exists in my area, just to, so we gave that as the option. Um, so, what percentage uh, of GPs do you think said no telecare exists in there? So higher. Higher? Lower. Lower? 59%. So, this, and I think this was one of the ones that was of particular interest to social care. They said, we've told them. So, let's be clear every area has some telecare there. Um, and every area said, we've told GPs about this a number of times, but 60% of GPs don't think it exists. So, the. Um, one of the big points in that is that the perception gap is at least as important as the service gap. We often say, what do, in this uh, perfect world of community services that can keep people out of hospital and out of residential care, what are we missing? Um, it's not just what we're missing, it's what isn't known and what isn't trusted by GPs and older people and elsewhere. And we don't nearly have nearly enough understanding of the knowledge and trust um, rather than just the service. Um, Okay, so now we've got some of the questions about motivation. So do you think, we asked GPs, would, what would change your advice on residential care? And we said, if, if, you, if it could mean you made less home visits, would that change the advice you gave on residential care? Do you think higher or lower than 59% of people, GPs said that? Higher, I think I'll go with the crowd. Yeah, so over two-thirds of GPs, um, self-confessed, would say... My, my advice on pointing people towards residential care is influenced by my own personal home visits. So, one of the important things from that is that there are tensions in the system that need exploring. Um, there is a tension, uh, a number of tensions for, with GPs, with uh, community services, one being 
am I discharging my uh, medical responsibility enough when I pass them to you rather than hospital? Another is, uh, this is a zero-sum game here. I would like less work and have it done more cheaply by other parts of the um, health and care sector. So there is a tension there, but it needs exploring. And I guess we're particularly concerned that some of the talk about integration seems to suggest if you integrate, we'll, take, we'll get rid of all those tensions and we'll all be a big happy family. And that just isn't the case. And I think we understand that, but there's far too much simplistic understanding that integration will resolve all the tensions. Some of that tension is good. There's a reason why GPs are trying to solve a different problem than social care. There's a reason there's a medical and social model. We want to get the best out of that tension, um, not eliminate it entirely. Last one. Okay, this, this was question. Would financial motivation change your advice on residential care? Do you think that was higher or lower than 68%? Any other? It was lower, 46%. A few didn't answer. So basically half of GPs said, if you financially incentivise me, I would change my advice, and half said they wouldn't. And interestingly, the halves who said they wouldn't were quite offended to be asked in the interviews, and the ones we worked with, you can't ask that question, of course we're not, we're doing this for the right reasons. And what we found when we looked at this further is, typically, the GPs that um, social care come into contact with, the ones who offer up the time, are in the half who are offended to be asked and do things for the right reason, and, and in fact, financial incentives turn them off but half of their colleagues are in the other half. So um, there's a, m a more sophisticated uh, understanding needed of how, how are we going to influence, which some messages that appeal to some are going to turn others off. So thank you very much, Joe. You did very well. well thank you very well, much. Yeah. Let's have a round of applause for Joe. So the particular point there was... Uh, GPs are different and don't assume that the ones you're seeing are representative of those you want to influence. So what are we, what are we doing with all that? We're working with the councils in the areas to um, change, uh, to actively change those perceptions and change those pathways by understanding those motivations. That involves looking at those perception gaps and how can we change those perception gaps. If you say you've told them about telecare um, 60 times, don't do it a 61st time unless you're doing something different. Um, understanding much more detail those um, the individual influences and the tensions and trying to resolve those and really turning that into ways of directly changing people's pathway big opportunities at kind of early intervention opportunities to get GP uh, practice visit as an opportunity to change somebody's pathway use the authority of a GP um, is in a positive way and also a crisis response that um, home care with other things around it is a legitimate response more often um, than, uh, than is used in hospital. Um, and it, I guess the, the, what's coming out of that is we wrote a paper at the beginning of this that suggested there was uh, around £600 million that could be saved by adult social care if we got this right. The work so far has confirmed that. The big thing it's added is that the savings for the NHS are even bigger. Um, the savings, particularly from um, avoiding hospital admissions, or unplanned admissions, are massive. Um, it, we're often focused on the bits of the system where there is attention, like um, hospital discharge, where there is a, uh, the, the acute trust want to get them out, and the seen as delayed transfers problem. Um, actually, there's a much more common shared agenda to keep people out of hospital in the first place that could be a, a real win-win. Um, that's. So that's all I want to say, really, and then uh, hand over to, to questions to see what you think of that. I was just very struck by one thing Jeremy said, which was that 92% of GPs want better relationships with social care. So in our course of today, we've been talking about a lot about getting in front of CCGs. It sounds like the ideal time for all of you guys to be talking to your local GPs and your commissioning GPs, because they obviously want to know something. Right, questions. Uh, we're back to Joe again. <laughs> Uh, 
Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, I, I, I don't know if anybody else is feeling the way I'm feeling right now. Um, because I would like to make inroads with CCGs. But I don't get the feeling that we know exactly where to start. Because I've tried in my local area to talk to my GP, for example, and he has no clue how his practice fits into the general um, structure. And I don't know if anybody else is experiencing the same sort of things. If the GPs don't know what the structure is like and how they fit into it, what chance do we providers have of making sense of the whole thing and supporting the people who need the support? Um, I don't know if you have any, if you can speak to that, Jeremy. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm, I'm certainly not claiming to be uh, the guru in this, but I would say, from our experience, two, two big lessons. One, um, differentiate, think more clearly about do you want to speak to GPs or the CCG, because actually that is different, and not everything has to go through the pipe of the CCG, of the few involved in that, and there's lots going on there. Actually, a lot happens. Uh, GPs with their provider role are very important. So we've had some really interesting uh, sessions at... Um, LMC meeting, so another acronym for you, of uh, GPs saying, we don't really care about the commissioning role, talk to us as GPs. Uh, the second thing is, if you want to get on the CCG agenda, you've got to fight for space when they're trying to work out what on earth do we do, prioritise of these hundreds of things. You've got to have something that's attention grabbing. At the moment, the ge generally CCGs are saying, home care, and in fact, all of social care isn't top of my priority list. Top of my priority list is what on earth am I doing with this hospital? So speak to something that hits them around unplanned care or something else that's a priority. Don't know if that's helpful. Money being, mon combining money and outcomes as well is a good one. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, Paul from uh, House in Home Care. Uh, when we've tried to speak to two different GPs in our area, the first reaction for both of them is you're from that sector that features on the front of the Daily Mail with abuse and all the rest of it. As part of your questionnaire, did you actually uh, talk to GPs about the image of uh, domiciliary care providers? So, sorry, I didn't catch that. <coughs> As part of your um, survey, did you actually speak to GPs about the image of the domiciliary care providers? Um, we, uh, so we, have, we, ha we do have some survey results on do they know and trust um, the quality of home care and the quality of social care in their area, but not, not getting down to too many specifics, but we do have some of that, yeah. Be happy because to clearly at our level it's a totally different question than, than one to the, to the commissioners. I think we might have had another gentleman over there. No? Go on that. Sorry, I've got such a bright light in my eye, it's hard to see. David Weatherly, Warnock Care. Um, did you actually see any projects of how to stop people going into residential care? Was there any good examples that you could share of home carers, you know, home providers, you know, actually working with the GP to stop people going into residential care? Um, yeah, yes, so they're just starting to implement now, so it's only kind of the, in the initial seeds of it, but yes, and the big, the big opportunities that have been... Um, spotting early intervention opportunities and an alternative crisis response at that point saying they're not going to go into hospital and then residential care we can support them in the community with home care and other things by packaging that differently i'm happy to share that have we any other questions uh yes there's i can see uh, an arm up there i can't see who it belongs to but there's a star there we go Hi, slightly, as a richard ellis hampshire county council slightly odd question GPs and those who work with them routinely say GPs don't understand social care, but a significant proportion of residential nursing homes and some dom care agencies are owned by GPs. How the hell can we explain that? It's a great question. It's a great thing to do in, um, with groups of GPs is start talking about what, what are the business interests and what are their drivers. But that our understanding of what, what, where are those incentives and do we understand them in the system? what people are incentivized and most motivated to do. We're only at the foothold of understanding. It's a fascinating area. Right, uh, if we go for the lady straight in front of me and then the gentleman across the aisle. Hi, Karen Ahmed, 
Barnet Council. Um, two quick ones. One was I was really surprised that GPs actually knew what reablement was, and I'd be interested if you had to actually explain what the concept was and whether or not that impacted them, whether they thought it was good or bad in, in their area. And the second was, is there any correlation between GPs who knew about social care or felt more confident in social care and those who sat on the CCG? Right, got the tough ones. <laughs> Um, so f firstly, um, it's interesting, we got, we got into what do they understand by the term, if anything, re re and there is a mixed picture. There's quite a dilemma actually for social care in terms of how much we explain. Generally we want to explain more about early intervention and prevention options to get that across, and generally we want to explain less about crisis, the crisis option, not make it complicated. If they've got a choice, A and E, or you're telling them about 50 different things, just tell them about one. So there's a, there's a, there is quite a tension there actually about how complex do we want to make it and often we, you know, we will say well it is simple, there's a rapid response service but it's only there till five o'clock, we've got single point of access, in fact we've got five, we don't make it so simple. Um, uh, so, some correlation um, with CCG but not as much as you might think actually. And then there was a gentleman on the side here. John Towers, Director of Care at Home based in Saffron Walden, Essex. Uh, my impression is that GPs and uh, social services and people generally in the public sector have, uh, dare I say, ethical issues about the idea of being seen to favour certain care providers over others. And uh, I've never really understood how we could overcome that potential objection. That's, um, there is a really big issue now around exploding, so GP is now having a formal commissioning role, um, which they actually have had, they've had micro commissioning role forever that plays into that and it just hasn't been appreciated. So and I, I think there's a whole load of work to do on that, on um, what, what, how do they play out that commissioning role in their day jobs and stepping back from it. And I don't think there's a lot, much clarity actually about that, there's very different practices all around the country. So, yeah. What, Sorry, can, we, what no can we do about it? <laughs> Uh, one thing is start collecting the evidence and asking the questions. You know, the amount of pushback we got from uh, asking some difficult questions. Um, I, I think, as a kind of wider sector, we need to start asking those difficult questions. Where do business interests play? Um, let's let's increase our evidence base. And this gentleman at the front, please. David Hogarth, um, Health Watch, Westminster. Um, did you do anything to find out how far GPs are aware of the different kinds of care? For example, sheltered housing, extra care, uh, as well as residential care and, do, and, and nursing care. So, um, so we've got, from the survey, we've got evidence at um, kind of description level, so what do you think of these services? And then in, from interviews, we've got a bit more, but more of an understanding. But it is it's difficult to get quantitative evidence because there are such different understandings. So we've got the beginnings of some, but I think there's more to be explored in that, absolutely. There was a lady in, a, I think, a floral top. Um, Helen the Little of the Abbeyfield Society. One of the things that concerns me is about um, the way people learn is often by shadowing and finding out and actually visiting. And one of the difficulties I see with GPs is it would cost them a lot to do that. And yet a day's investment might be a very good way of understanding what some of the differences are that the colleague from uh, Healthwatch said. Because I think, you know, they may have an idea, but the reality is very different. And it may be pie in the sky, but I would like to think about you know, that being part of their um, continued professional development, to have an understanding of what's out there so that they can make informed choices. I totally agree. There's a, I think there's a particular um, challenge around those from smaller practices, the so single-handed or small practices, where they, they have less luxury of specialising or learning from each other. I think it's a, there's a, that's, that's a nationwide challenge. There's a real opportunity there that you've got a community leader who understands their patch, but a challenge in getting any time time with them, so I absolutely agree, I think we should prioritise that. Um, 